Yeah, hello, Mike. Well, good morning and uh, good evening from Western Australia. Yes, um, you are. I, I was watching you a little bit earlier on. You looked as if you were in a sort of desert location, but you obviously moved now to somewhere a bit greener. Tell us uh, what you can see around you. Yes, well, you know, we've been here in Western Australia for a few nights now, spending most of the time looking up, enjoying the dark skies here um, and stargazing. But actually, today was all about the solar eclipse. Yes. It was one of the only places on mainland planet Earth where we could witness the total solar eclipse at 11.27 right. this morning. Quite an incredible event. Yeah, and an incredible sight when, wherever you can see it in the world. You, you're very lucky to have been able to, to see it at all, really. But people from all over the world were flocking down there, weren't they? Yes, this was a very rare hybrid solar eclipse. They happen about once every 10 to 14 years. Right. So thousands of people from all around the world came here um, to witness this event. And uh, and it was incredible to, to see that kind of human reaction, that human emotion behind something that's very surreal, very otherworldly. Yes, indeed. And is it true, because I've never been able to see one of those things, you know, as clearly as you've just done that, is it true that everything kind of goes a little bit weird in the natural world, that there's, you know, sort of birds are silenced and, you know, animals stop and, and other animals run and hide? What happens? It's very true, and actually it makes perfect sense when you witness it yourself because it is such a strange thing that happens. It, it happens very quickly, the actual um, shutting off of the sun, those, mm. those kind of four or five minutes where the sun completely disappears uh, and the moon shadow comes over, all the animals go quiet, birds come home to roost, um, and the shadows are, are really spectacular. You look out at the horizon and you can see daylight on the horizon, but we're under this sort of big shadow of mm. darkness. Right. It's very very strange, very spooky. And we're seeing people looking at it now through sort of various different tinged spectacles, I imagine. You're not supposed to look right at it, are you? Definitely not. You know, you have to use correct protective eyewear. You can really do some serious damage to your eyes if you look at the sun. So we all had the protective glasses on it. Or you can make yourself a pinhole camera or uh, just take photographs through a telescope, something like that. Yes. Well, it looks like an amazing uh, event. And what, what else happens around it? And, and when do you expect the, the next one of these to happen? So the next uh, total solar eclipse, is, I think, is next year, uh, April 2024. Um, and I think the United States actually is going to, to be able to, to witness that. Um, the next hybrid eclipse won't be till about 2031. Um, so we've got a, a long time to wait. And for the UK, I'm afraid we have to wait till about 2090 before we see the next total solar eclipse there. Yes, because I seem to remember we had one here. We sent somebody down uh, onto our sort of uh, overlooking uh, outdoor kind of balcony area and they were filming it for us. And I think I remember hearing at that time it would be 2090 for the next one and basically i don't think i'll be around for that sadly <laughs> <laughs> yeah me neither unfortunately but uh, but you know uh, for the people there in the uk they'll be able to enjoy that incredible event when it happens i think 1999 was the uh, the last total solar eclipse in the uk yes down in cornwall right now an awful lot of interest in space these days isn't there because we've got elon musk and the whole spacex program we had a um a european uh, space agency a rocket fired up recently to go and find some intelligent life forms i was suggesting that if they do find them perhaps they can bring them back here and run run the country with them because um, there's not much left here in westminster it seems to be <laughs> Yeah, no, we, we really are on a, a new era of space exploration. It's very exciting. Uh, in just a couple of hours' time, we hope that SpaceX's Starship will have its inaugural test flight, uh, paving the way to returning humans to the surface of the moon. That's a really important rocket right. that's going to take astronauts down to the surface. ESA's uh, JUICE mission, the European Space Agency, that is looking for signs of life on Jupiter's moons. Um, that's incredibly exciting. A lot of scientific information we'll gain for those missions. Uh, and it's incredible what is planned for the next sort of 10 to 15 years in space flight. Uh, it's a, a really exciting period. Yeah, because I'm reading in the Times today that there's a big sort of move towards space tourism and the French are going to get involved and they're going to call uh, for a luxury pressurised capsule to be created which will be sent up to space complete with haute cuisine. <laughs> I think you're going to see a lot more uh, of space tourism. You know, as, as the cost of access to space comes down, it becomes more accessible both for research communities, for science, for education, and, of course, for those people who wish to pay 
to go to space themselves. Uh, we need to make sure we continue to do it in a sustainable way um, and make sure we regulate space so that it's uh, you know continues to help solve the problems and not add to the problems that we've got. But it's it's really exciting that more and more people are going to have access to space. I mean, do you think there will be sort of space hotels and things that in say my in mine and your lifetime that people can go and stay in? I think there will be. Um, you know, commercial operators now uh, are starting to build the first privately owned space station in low earth orbit and that's actually a good thing for the national space agencies it frees up resources to be able to do things like the artemis program and go further afield to the moon mm. to mars um, without having to also run a space station in low earth orbit too so i think we are going to see that kind of thing in the next 10 to 15 years and will it only be for the super rich though or will it be for everyone I think we'll start off uh, something for the super rich. It's a bit like aviation, really. Back in the 1920s, 1930s, it was incredibly expensive to get a transatlantic flight. Uh, now it's become affordable for a much wider you know, range of the population. I think that's the same with human spaceflight. At the moment, it's very, very expensive. In 100 years' time, I think it will be accessible for many, many people. Right. And they're talking about a low-carbon sort of balloon the French, uh, they're going to talk, uh, you've probably seen this, the Falto Celeste, uh, which is going to provide this Michelin star uh, uh, a piece of uh, uh, a sort of food entertainment, luxury interior and the carbon footprint no bigger than making a pair, than what you get from making a pair of jeans. But the picture of it looks like it's a sort of a, gondola, a very large gondola underneath a, a very large balloon. But how do you get that up there? I'm not sure the science behind that particular uh, endeavour, but yes, I mean, it's a case of getting up to be able to see the curvature of the Earth yeah. and to have an experience of, of going into space. But part of that really is about going into orbit to actually experience weightlessness. Um, but you're absolutely right in terms of these um, uh, engineering and innovative ideas to be uh, zero carbon or low carbon. That's really important too. Mm. Rocket fuel essentially can be very clean, just hydrogen and oxygen byproduct is water. Uh, but we do need to be able to look at the uh, the impact of sending more and more things into mm. space and how we manage that and control it and make sure that space remains accessible for our future generations. Right. And, and just finally, Tim, a, a couple of weeks ago, I think it was, there was some episode in space where there was a whole bunch of planets aligned that we could actually see. I didn't see them, as it turns out, as I was in London. Um, anything coming up that we can be looking out for? Well, there's always interesting and exciting things to look out for on, on any evening. Um, you know, there's the space station, you can see um, the planets to look up. You'll see Jupiter, Saturn, Venus, Mars, uh, the strip of the Milky Way. Mm. So there's there's always fascinating things to be seeing in space. Um, and uh, I think uh, what's really exciting in human space flight after this Starship test flight is next year we're hoping to launch the first crew back to the moon, not to go onto the surface, but in orbit around the moon on the Artemis II mission. Mm. That's the really next major milestone in our human space exploration programme. OK, brilliant stuff. Tim, thanks very much indeed for staying up so late to talk to us. Major Tim Peake there, British astronaut, reporting in uh, from that World Heritage Site, Ningaloo, in Western Australia, uh, where they saw the first, uh, one of the big eclipses that only happens about once every seven to ten years, uh, and we won't see another one here until 2090, apparently, so I won't be seeing that. Uh, George